No discussion of girls' education would be complete without the input of, well, girls. They are the present and the future of our cause, and they possess a relevant and intuitive understanding of the issue of educating girls in the modern world that we would be remiss to ignore. Emma Willard tends to attract girls who have a vision of themselves that is not ordinary. Remember, our girls are making a counterculture choice to come to Emma Willard, a single-sex boarding school. They give up the traditions of a co-ed school to pursue the kind of experience that will enable them to be extraordinary. I'm proud to introduce one of the shining stars of Emma, Taylor Garrison, a senior at Emma who has been an active participant in choir, orchestra, and the ballet program for the past two years. She's also served as the editor-in-chief of our yearbook. Taylor serves on the Audacia Student Advisory Committee, which helped to develop the Audacia logo. Please welcome Taylor Garrison. Thank you, Ms. Hall. It is an honor to represent the students of Emma at the Audacia Forum. Serving on the Student Advisory Committee for Audacia has been a daunting and rewarding experience. We have been invited to participate in the development of the concept and its implementation from its earliest stages. Once we settled on a name, we were asked to create the logo for Audacia. The logo needed to be bold like our founder, inspiring like our mission, and exuberant like the ideals of young girls. As part of our basic curriculum at Emma, we are taught to ask, how can I help? We are encouraged to develop a vision of the world beyond our campus, which is at once realistic and idealistic. We extend our sisterhood to girls all over the world and dedicate ourselves to their cause. I'd like to take a moment now to acknowledge my peers who are volunteering throughout the forum. At this time, would all of the Emma student volunteers please stand? Ladies and gentlemen, you have come here in support of global girls' education. We understand the challenges are great. We know that solutions can seem elusive. We accept that the rewards may sometimes be unquantifiable, but your cause is noble. You fight for the rights of girls, and we, the students of Emma, ask, how can we help? Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, and, and thanks to the Student Advisory Board for giving the idea of, an Auda of Audacia a visual identity. It was pretty exciting to watch them become involved in that process. This afternoon, we have the privilege, for once, of letting the dollar signs get parked at the door for a brief moment as we focus on the girl and what works for the girl. As we discuss programs that produce confident young women who are the drivers in their own lives, sturdy young women of grit and substance, competent young women who have mastered the life skills necessary to take control of their lives and their life trajectory. Fortunately, much research has been done to establish the commonalities of best practice. Fortuitously, for the purpose of this panel, and I suppose not surprisingly, many if not all the factors found in such programs are universal. They transcend boundaries of race, cultural, and socioeconomic diversity. It turns out that what works in sub-Saharan Africa just might work as well on the streets of Detroit. Girls need to be respected. They need to be physically safe. They need to be empowered. They need fiscal savvy. And they need knowledge of social systems. Research conducted by the World Bank is instructive. In a study contributed by Eric Hanushek of Stanford University, we learned that it is the quality of education, what students know, as opposed to the educational attainment, how long students stay in school, that determines the economic success of the individual. I think that research outcome, more than many, points us to the core of our subject today. So what do girls need to know? To launch our panel, I want to briefly mention four critical elements that I believe undergird best practice in girls-centered programming. And then I'll introduce our panelists, and we'll all dive into the fray, opening up for questions after we have stirred the soup a bit. First and foremost, 
His programs in schools, after school, and alternative settings are designed with secondary schools in mind. We know that safety must be a central consideration. In this category, I include both emotional and physical safety. Consideration for safe transportation to and from program or school. The distance between the home and the setting, which, as it gets greater, disproportionately impacts girls. Enforced codes of conduct that address sexual harassment and the entire continuum of gender-based violence and basic sanitation needs for girls. Teachers should be schooled in gender-sensitive training. Uh, unhealthy and discriminatory stereotypes should be removed from the curriculum or the setting. Those engaged in the design of the program must be sensitized to the language that's disempowering for girls and strategies that are destructive in the formation of a strong, positive sense of self. A second best practice consideration would certainly be quality adult mentoring for girls. CAMFED, the Campaign for Female Education, has set the standard in this regard, creating a three-day teacher training program that instructs teachers how best to mentor at-risk girls. Nearly 5,000 teachers have been trained throughout its five country programs, and CAMFED boasts an astounding retention rate of 90% of girls enrolled in schools who stay enrolled thanks to this intervention strategy. Successful mentoring is more than simply placing girls with adult role models. Attention must be paid to compatibility between the mentor and the mentee, sustaining the relationship over a meaningful length of time far beyond sporadic engagement, and tailoring the mentoring program to the developmental stage of the girl. Quite simply, and we all know this, girls are relational beings. Maximizing mentoring relationships maximizes outcomes for girls. The third ingredient for successful programming involves creating opportunities for girls to be empowered with basic life skills. Essentially, competency increases self-confidence. And increased self-confidence pays untold dividends throughout the lifespan of a woman. There are a wide spectrum of programs that might fit this category technological competency, fluency in a second language, financial acumen, knowledge of power structures, HIV prevention and sexual and reproductive proactivity, professional etiquette, raising awareness regarding potential gender inequity, vocational skills that make girls and women employable or useful in traditional or non-traditional ways. Competency increases the likelihood that a girl will find something practical and constructive to do to put a roof over her head and dollars in her bank account, whether she lives in a developing country or has just graduated from a prestigious high school. Finally, the last element I will mention briefly today is the delivery method of the program. We need to meet girls where they are. Best practice may well mean extending the school day in useful ways to accommodate work or babysitting schedules using online programs, as we've heard a bit about today, and distance learning to access remote locations, adding basic skill training programs to work environments to ensure access, using public schools during downtimes as safe havens for programming, and using technology to enhance the individualization of learning environments and grow the world of girls who need to have the boundaries of their universe enlarged. Let's be creative and think outside the box as we imagine what girls need and how we will bring it to them. We believe that girls flourish when they can take risks in safe environments, when they can fail and learn resilience without dire consequences, when they are in healthy relationships with knowledgeable adult mentors who will raise the bar on expectations, and when they are confident that they are competent now let me introduce our panelists and have them join me on the stage. I'm going to start with Sarah. Sarah Posada is currently a portfolio manager at the Nike Foundation, funding programs that empower adolescent girls worldwide. Now, what I've each asked each of our panelists to do, and I gave them this question in advance so they should have stellar answers, I want them to answer the following question. How did you come to care so deeply about girls 
and how, how, you come, how did you come to be involved in developing, implementing, and overseeing schools and programs in which girls flourish. So Sarah, tell us your story. Thanks so much, Trudy. And uh, first of all, thank everyone for, for having us here today. It's a real honor to be here speaking with you. Um, so I was thinking about this question, and I, I went back to an experience I had when I was 20, 21 years old. I was studying abroad in Zimbabwe. And I lived with three different families there. I lived with a rural family, I lived in a high density township, and I lived in a very pleasant middle class suburban community. And in each of those three families, there was a 14 to 16 year old girl living with us who was doing all of the work in the home. Um, she may or may not have go been going to school, but no matter what, she was up first, working and, and last to bed. I was not too many years out of my own adolescence at that point, so it was a very clear point of comparison between what her life was like and what my life has been like. Um, I spent, I had a really great adolescence, actually. I had a wonderful group of friends. I still have those friends. I had a teacher who really believed in me. I went to a pretty good school. I had a clear path to college. Um, so it was a very strong point of comparison and also disparity then made me think a lot. Um, going even further back, when I was a little girl, I loved to read, I still love to read, um, but I loved to read books about girls from a long time ago. I loved the Little House on the Prairie series, I loved Anne of Green Gables, and uh, so aside from having all those spunky young heroines in my life, I really had a very clear picture that societies change. We can make progress. The way things were 100 years ago is not the way we're growing up now. So. Um, I believe I really came into my adulthood with those two values. Progress happens and adolescence is a really important time for things to come together if you're going to do, um, do what you want to do in the world. So with those two qualities, I've, I've had the great fortune to be able to work with um, youth development agencies, uh, mostly in the developing world. I've worked in Southern Africa, I've worked in Central America, and also in South Asia. I've had um, the great honor to work in Afghanistan, building community-based schools uh, for a number of years. And from that experience, I moved on to the Nike Foundation, where we invest in adolescent girls' empowerment and the girl effect. Thank you. And so then we have Kathleen Pons, who's the director of new initiatives for the Young Women's Leadership Network. She's the recipient of Harlem Children's School Storefront School Educator of the Year Award. Kathleen, how did you come to love girls and programs for girls? Um, I, I have a, a personal story that's probably very different from Sarah's. Uh, my mother didn't go to college and my father was a career army officer and I had an older brother and a younger brother uh, and an Italian grandmother living with us all my life. All efforts and resources went towards making sure that the boys would get to college. Okay. The focus on me was to make me the best housekeeper on the planet so that I could be a great wife. <clears throat> Because we moved so much, and by the time I had graduated high school, I had gone to 14 different schools, Asia, Europe, all over the United States, uh, private schools, parochial schools, government schools, public schools. Um, I was able to taste the flavor of an all-girls educational environment. And I always loved being in an all-girls setting. It made me feel valued. It made me feel empowered. It made me feel like everything was possible. So fast forward uh, through multiple different career trajectories. Uh, in 2001, I applied to become the principal of the Young Women's Leadership School in East Harlem. And I considered it the fulfillment of a life dream to lead an educational community focused on creating post-secondary options for girls most of whom are first-generation minority girls in the inner city, the first in their families to go to college. Uh, it was the most rewarding job in the world, even though I took it late in life. <clears throat> and I am so fortunate to continue to be able to work with that school, its four replications here in the city, and affiliates all over the country. Um, I love the work, uh, and I think our prior panel, which really set the bar high, that was a hard act to follow, mm. Uh, and the audience as well are all in agreement that um, girls will change the world if we support them. Thank you so much. 
And then we have Anne Van Zyl. Now, Anne was appointed head of the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in January of 2010, having had experience as head of four very different schools, uh, schools girls boarding and day, co-ed, new and traditional in both urban and rural settings. Anne? Thank you. Um, my background is very um, parochial by comparison with uh, these folks that I'm sharing the stage with. Um, I was born in South Africa. Um, I had a very traditional upbringing, uh, similar to many of the girls from, at the Emma Willard School, but I had a very remarkable mother who um, believed in um, independence, uh, who was an, a maverick, and of course I grew up in apartheid South Africa um, during the 60s and 70s when things were pretty tough, and my mother was one of those women who stood out of, outside Parliament and outside the university with a placard wearing a black sash, it was called the Black Sash Women's Movement, which was really very influential in uh, apartheid South Africa. Interestingly, they could never be accused of meeting because they, had, they stood 50 yards apart from each other. And that was a very, very strong protest movement. Uh, as far as I was concerned, all my mother was doing was embarrassing me standing at the side of the road. But I mean, that's a typical uh, teenage reaction. However, she instilled in me a very strong sense of of right and wrong. Um, I was lucky enough to be an exchange student to America. Um, I was an American field service exchange student and so thought uh, in the time of uh, met President Kennedy, which dates me immediately, and um, I was thought I would be obviously instrumental in bringing peace to the world in the 1960s. Um, and that's what I set out to do. Of course, um, it wasn't so easy and um, I started teaching through the back door, actually. I, I was married. I had uh, married a widower with two small children. I landed up in a city where I knew nobody, and so I started teaching, and I absolutely loved it. And um, ten years later, I was head of Pretoria Girls High, which was a, the largest girls, English-speaking girls state school in South Africa. I had 980 girls, and that was in the 1980s, which is when South Africa was in a very, very different place. And the school that I was running was all white. And in 1990, the writing was on the wall and we were allowed to open the doors to become multi-racial uh, on condition that the parents agreed. And we had to get a 94% uh, parent participation and a 94% yes vote. And all the English-speaking schools in South Africa did that within a year. These are just little parts that have really influenced my life. I think to have been in South Africa as a head of school for the last 23 years has been a journey in growth, uh, a girls' education, the whole idea of racial diversity. The, when I look at the school that I'm running now and the school that I ran 23 years ago, they are very different places. And education has changed and technology has changed. But all those wonderful things that we want to make girls do. Find their voice. Find their voice whether they're in Africa, whether they're here, um, and the whole idea of girls being able to do it no matter what is something that's just been part of me. Um, so I, I didn't have an epiphany moment. I was just made that way, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, to the last school that I've come to, which has been the most amazing experience to be part of a school which is unique in that we have 380 girls at a fully residential boarding school and we are not just trying to get them through 12th grade. We are trying to give them a quality education equal to the best quality education, girls education that is in, available. And so what we are trying to do, essentially, is to have something similar to Emma Willard in Johannesburg for these girls. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful, wonderful project. And we have amazing girls who are going to show you a few things in the near future. 
We'll have to bring them for the next audition. Right? Absolutely. Um, the way this is going to work, there's nothing more deadly um, than seeing an audience and watching um, people on the panel um, in lockstep answer the same question. So I'm going to direct a question uh, <laughs> to one of the panelists. Feel free to jump in on each other. And in a magic moment, we'll invite you into our conversation. So my first question is going to go to you, Kathleen. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> we use the term holistic learning experiences, holistic learning experiences, as if everyone in this room knows exactly what that means. What do you mean when you say holistic learning experiences for girls? Um, I mean the whole girl. And uh, given the population of girls that we work with in the inner city, and our programs are not gifted or accelerated, um, <clears throat> in fact, we generally our kids are average to below average. They come to us in the 11th grade. <clears throat> they have issues around student achievement, and of course they have issues around gender and race and class stereotypes. Um, and we made a decision early on that to maximize their chances for achievement, we would have to work with the whole girl. And so in addition to trying to create the most rigorous academic environment we can, we also address their developmental needs, physical, social, and emotional, through a number of different structures. Uh, one of the main ones is our advisory program, which is a great structure for, develop, for dealing with all the non-academic needs of girls, uh, and scaffolding age-appropriate topics and activities across the seventh grade continuum because we work with girls from grade 6 to 12. Uh, and then the genius of Young Women's Leadership Network and our founder, Ann Tish, and the wonderful women I work with, has been developing um, add-ons and enhancements to the school day, which also address the whole girl, her early college and career awareness, uh, the College Bound Initiative, which gives every girl a full-time college guidance counselor charged with connecting her with post-secondary options and financial options. Uh, leadership development for every girl. Uh, health and wellness programs and high quality uh, STEM activities. Supporting our principals, supporting our teachers uh, is another thing that we do, but making sure that we're enhancing the academic experience because we want our girls to go off and take their place at the table at the finest colleges and universities in the country, and they can't do that on a level playing field unless we have uh, addressed their needs globally, holistically, unless we've developed the whole girl. So we have a variety of different programs that we use, which we can chat about later, but that's what we mean by developing the whole girl. I'd, I'd also like to add, in addition to the standard curriculum, there's also a hidden curriculum in our schools that addresses all of these issues that the girls that we work with are facing. The teachers are very sensitized to issues of gender and race and class that our kids have to deal with, and they do a wonderful job uh, at helping our girls really actualize all of their potential in spite of the roadblocks that are still out there for girls. Thanks. Anne? Um, I, 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 it's wonderful to hear that because that's exactly what we're trying to do. But one of our challenges, and I think it's a challenge of anybody dealing with um, children in poverty. If, you are, if your background is one of poverty, your life is focused on the next meal, a roof over your head. And what we find is, and I would be interested to know if, if you have the same sort of thing, we have children arriving at the age of 11 or 12. Uh, all right, the, the language is something that they've got to learn English, uh, which we do, and we do math, and we do all of that sort of thing. But what we really have to deal with is what I call the gap. When I look at, at my, my grandchildren and the children, the privileged children, and I look at the stimulation that they have before birth, I mean, you pray the Mozart when they're in utero, and. Uh, you know, and from the moment children uh, in a privileged society are born, they are stimulated. Now you take the equivalent child in a, in a third world or poverty situation, and it's that, that gap, that nothingness that you, we've got to try and fill. And those are the programs, and I mean, we do all the things that you say. But if anybody knows a way of filling that huge gap of knowledge, of general knowledge, of 
mores of who I am and where I fit into the world, the world of a poor child is really, really narrow. And so what we've got to find are effective ways of broadening their horizons, which you can you do through, through technology. I mean, they're all linked to the, the net and that sort of thing. But it's more than that. It's yeah, all it those lost, it's the lost years that we have to try. The lost years. Yeah, mm. I, the lost if, years. If well, we I have could, to, uh, we have to give Sarah a chance to talk too. Yes. I mean, do you want to die? I've seen <laughs> your head. <laughs> you're just nodding with Kathleen. I'm really bad at taking head. turns, I admit it. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> The girls that we work with um, through our partners at the Nike Foundation may or may not have had uh, even primary schooling, so that gap that you speak to really does exist. Um, what, what, we're, what we see, though, is that when girls reach puberty, they may have had um, some more stimulation, more exposure to the outside world, but in many contexts, once they reach puberty, once they become um, you know, even somewhat sexualized beings, their world closes in around them, and that's when they become really isolated. Uh, they may lose the opportunity to see friends they used to have. They, um, they have a whole lot more work to do at home. They may be taken out of school. So when we look at holistic programming for girls at that age, really starting at 10 or 12, um, we look um, first and foremost at building the social assets, making sure that she has friends. Uh, it seems so basic, but it's really, I would say, I think it underpins absolutely ed mm. any possible success is, is a strong social network. Um, a mentor or a teacher who she can look up to is, is the other key piece of that. Um, and then the other piece is we look, of course, at the academic side of things. Um, and depending on the context, that might be sort of higher level or it might be basic literacy. Um, we look a lot at um, the life skills piece, so learning about your own body, learning about your community, how, where you fit in in the community, how you relate to others, and really importantly, we also look at the economic empowerment piece. How, mm -hmm. what's money? How do you use a budget? What are your financial goals? Do you have a bank account? Do you have even an ID that will allow you to access a bank account? So um, I'd say we go uh, at a much more basic level because um, not all of our, few of our programs actually are at at formal schools, but I think all of those pieces play a role in all of these programs and, and also speak to what you mentioned earlier, Judy. So now you get to dive right back in. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. What Sarah's saying is absolutely essential, um, but I, I was really intrigued by you putting your finger on uh, the big problem that we face with kids that come in delayed. Uh, and they're, at a certain point, uh, you can try to emulate the incredible things that go on at the richest private and independent schools in the country. And at a certain point, it's a hard conversation or a hard realization that the child has to take on for herself that responsibility for the rest of her life. Okay, she got a late start, but the harder she works, the smarter she's going to get. Absolutely. Learning is a lifetime endeavor. It's a lifetime process. It never stops. And so keeping that hope alive, picking her up when she falls down and say, do it again, try it again, you can do it, because it's just a fact of their lives that they're going to be behind, okay? But I have seen miracles happen when you support kids over a six or seven year period, the heights to which they can aspire is really very inspirational. Absolutely, for, and I think also, moment. I was going to say, for a moment, could we drive, dive maybe from the general to the specific? I mean, I think folks who've come here today are, are looking for examples of programs that are replicable or things that they know will work. Can any of you speak to something you personally have seen, a program that you know works? Well, all I know that works is that if you have committed teachers and committed children, anything is possible. Um, so, um, you know, whether, whether you're doing an a, a AP curriculum or a, whatever the curriculum is, IB or whatever, or a local curriculum, if you have got teachers who are competent, who are effective, anything is possible. And, I, and the other thing is, is not to, not to limit children because they've had a late start or they come from a disadvantaged background. So many of the, when I arrived at the, at the Oprah Winfrey School, the teachers were saying, gosh, these children are doing well. Uh, aren't these children marvelous? And I said, they're doing well. But I said, we are trying, we, we are setting the bar here. D 
do not let us compromise or patronize because we still have a long way to go. So do not limit the, the potential of a child who comes with, with a gap or a, whatever you like to call it. But with, with competent and with all the technology and all the things one can do and the mentoring, anything is possible if you, give, if you have commitment on both sides. And good old fashioned, uh, terribly old fashioned, time on task. No <laughs> substitute for that, even in this day of the internet. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I don't know if you understand that the schools that we work in are not our schools, per se, they're district public schools. <clears throat> and so uh, we have a public-private partnership with them. And we are uh, doing um, an add-on, a layering, an enhancement of the basic bread and butter that the public schools are doing. And I think what has really worked for us, and we know it has, uh, is this private college guidance counselor in the school who is charged with working with every girl in the school, not just the girls who self-select. So that from the time the kids walk in the door, there's college talk everywhere, and they're marinated in college thoughts, and everyone is focused on college to the point that now the parents want to go to college. Okay? Um, so that really works by giving them that resource um, and having that person work with everyone in the school. Another thing that works are uh, what my colleague Sarah likes to call touch points, where you focus on age appropriate, grade appropriate enhancements throughout the continuum. Uh, so that could be anything from our career fairs, job shadowing, uh, teaching ninth graders what they have to do in high school to have options for college, teaching communication skills uh, to the upper class girls, uh, doing workshops on financial literacy and etiquette and getting along with other people in the senior year. All of those workshops we've developed over time in concert with our principals and teachers are really having an impact. And our, our executive director, Ann Adler, um, has been doing research for over a year now. And she's able to proudly show that our students are graduating college at three times the rate of their peers. So we know that these things that we're bringing to the table are having a strong impact. I'm sorry, I got a frog in my throat. There you go. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the programs that, um, that I think is really fantastic, it's a holistic girls empowerment program. It's not based out of school. It's, um, it's in the state of Maharashtra in India, working with indigenous girls who live in rural areas there. Uh, and it, it was set up to be a program that addressed child malnutrition by working with girls before they become young mothers. Um, but what became a very exciting component of this program is the fact that the girl, you know, to your point about time on task, and the girls meet six times a week for hours a day. They do literacy training. Again, they learn the life skills piece. But there's a big component also that um, involves field trips to local services, visiting the health clinic, visiting the bank, visiting the um, the chief of the village, the village governance meetings, and really helping girls understand um, what their rights are and what they can demand as citizens of that community, even as children, even as girls. And some of the impacts of the program have been phenomenal. Um, girls learned, for example, girls in one village learned, wait a second, we're supposed to be getting electricity. You're speaking to someone's earlier point about corruption. Why don't we, and electricity for that matter, why don't we have electricity in, their, in, in our village? And they went to the village council and demanded it and basically had a sit-in until those funds were directed towards electricity in their village. We have tons of stories about um, public toilets, about uh, vaccination workers who would not come to the village until the girls said, wait a second, our younger brothers and sisters aren't getting vaccinated, what's the deal? We'll go to your house and escort you to our village and watch you perform these vaccinations. So um, a real sense of empowerment comes, I think, from linking girls to the outside world. Uh, and I'm sure, well, quite clearly, oh, you yeah, all see that in your agree. programs yeah. as well. I mean, our founder always says if they can see it, they can be it. So you're taking kids who just have not had the exposure. Once they get exposed, it's like lighting a fire. Yeah, yeah, let them go, yeah. yeah. 
we, have we, a, we have an extensive... Um, our girls are also committed to giving back to the community. Um, all of the children um, at the school come out of um, very economically disadvantaged homes. And in South Africa, that equates to trauma, violence, abuse, and all the other things that go with economic um, disadvantage. Um, but the girls are, are very are encouraged to go and work in, in the community. First of all, from the school, we have community service, as many of your schools do, but they go into, and they choose where they go within a 15 kilometer radius. We have buses that go out every day, because I've said that it's no good going once in and sort of descending like an angel and dispensing largesse and then disappearing for a year. You need to establish relationships. So they establish relationships at, at AIDS orphanages, at um, children's homes and old age homes and things like that. And then added to that, off their own bat, they have decided during the holidays to go back to their own primary schools to, to help in those schools. Um, our children arrive typically in year seven to our school, from year six, which is still elementary school, I think you would call it in the United States. And, they and the thing that's unique about our school is that they come from all over South Africa, so from all nine provinces. So it's not a community school, it's a national <coughs> school. Their children, uh, the main languages spoken are Suta and Zulu. There are closer speaking, there are colored children, there are Indian ch children um, who come from Natal and their children from, as I say, all nine provinces. So it's a, it's a very mixed community which has its own challenges. I'm not saying that what we've done um, isn't perfect, but it, it's been a huge challenge, but we, we're doing some things right and things like community service, I think we're really getting right. And then the things like, as you say, like the expeditions and outings, we try and see that every child in the course of their five years gets to, to have various leadership courses, camps as you would call them, and go to various parts of South Africa uh, in the course so that they have an idea of this, the country's history and heritage. So in addition to leadership being identified with the service to others, yes. or making Servant the world a better place, what, what other leadership traits are you finding that you need to teach these girls, you need to empower these girls to own? What are the leadership traits mm -hmm. are there that you're teaching in your programs? Mm -hmm. I, I find that many, many of our girls are raised to be followers before they get to us. And if we can, um, in the non-academic piece, teach them to lead themselves in a positive way, teach them to make the right choices, especially when they're surrounded by a lot of toxic media and a lot of images of girls that are pointing them in another direction. And when the school day's over, they're going back into an environment that is once again expecting them to be a follower. That's our challenge, to keep um, surfacing and emphasizing and nurturing the leadership of the self in a positive direction to change yourself, to change your family, change your community, change your world. But it starts on the inside, one girl at a time, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> we, um, we spend a lot of time working with girls on negotiation skills mm -hmm. and really having them practice what that looks like <clears throat> and, and practice that in groups with each other before taking that sort of to the broader world. And I think it's practice that really yeah. makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the nice things about an all-girls school. You can create a gazillion opportunities yeah. for leadership yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Um, one of the things that um, we look at very carefully <coughs> is children finding their vo girls finding their voices. Um, and it's, it's interesting because our girls have to come out of one world. They come out of a world of disadvantage, of trauma, and they're put into a, a, an incredibly beautifully resourced space, which is safe, which is all the things that you were talking about, safe, wonderful people <coughs> supporting them. And they don't go back every day, but every three months they have to go back into their other world. So they have to have an element of resilience to move, and I call it moving from one world into another world, 
and to know how to behave in each of the worlds. Because remember, we have a cultural thing here, so that uh, when you're at home and Granny talks to you, you look down and you don't look her in the eyes. When you're at the Oprah school, we say, for heaven's sake, my girl, stand up and look me in the eye and, and, and you, know, behave, you know, do what you're supposed to do. And uh, because that is uh, the Western way, if you like, of doing it, that's accepted if they're going to be global citizens. I'm not trying to necessarily translate them into you know, little English ladies, but it's global, we're looking at global. So the children, and the wonderful thing is that the girls understand this two worlds. And they often um, dramatize it. If we have, for example, um, life, or we have a subject called life orientation, which are all the life skill things. And uh, I'll just give you an example. We had, the girls had to do an, an issue on conflict. So they were divided up into groups and they said, go and show a conflict. And I was invited to come uh, watch the conflict uh, play out. And there was the girl sitting in the seat and she was covered with a shawl and a thing over her head. She was obviously the granny. And standing next to her were the two country cousins. And then there was the girl who came from the city with a low cut dress and the cell phone. And then uh, what they did was they played out what happened when the city girl came to the country. But the point I'm making is that they not only recognize the two worlds, they can make fun of it, they can use humor in it. And so I think that if you understand where you come from, and then you can talk about it, and you can act it out. I mean, they, they were obviously very articulate if, if you came to talk to them. If any of you came to talk to them, they would all be telling you stories and sparkling, and they would use their hands and, you know, um, uh, 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 marvelous. But they, they, are, they understand the sensitivities of different worlds. And I think that's a very important life skill if you're going to be a global citizen. Do not presume that the person that you are interacting with, perhaps through the medium of English, comes out of the same world as you do. There might well be cultural sensitivities. I mean, even gestures and things like that, we've got to be so aware of. So it's that s cultural sensitivity, which I think is wonderful, which they've learned and acquired. So you're talking about then a perception, really. You're actually talking about giving them practice at trying to name the perceptions they're having. Yeah. All right. Mm. Um, so let me, let me direct this one at Sarah. Mm. Um, as you think about the, the programs that you know and you've been responsible for, what we know about um, these young women is to even act on those perceptions, they must have a level of self-confidence that oftentimes, as we know with adolescent girls, takes a near universal dip in every culture, um, in every universe. And so what, what is it that you do to prompt that or promote that self-confidence in this moment when they're also trying to pick up all of these nuances about being in different cultures and aware of different sensitivities, as you suggest. So we're in the middle of it, you've got the girl and, and how she becomes, how she owns her own sense of self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm thinking about a program that we support um, called Binti Pomoja, which is in a uh, which is in Nairobi, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, this is a program that brings girls together in a very safe space, I mean behind the wall in this fairly dangerous neighborhood um, and brings them together to learn from each other, to learn from their mentor. And uh, so you ask, how do we, how do we bring up their, their confidence at this time? I think the first key piece is breaking through that isolation that the girls were have been experiencing, um, letting them know that they're not alone, that all of the girls are facing these issues at the same time. I think that's that's fundamental. Um, giving them a space to, to talk about their problems and also to play through their problems. I think play is really uh, confidence building and you can do it through art, you can do it through drama, but play is again a place to practice and, and to try on new values and, and for me that's that's a really important piece. Uh, one of the things that I think is um, that's great about this Binti Pomoja program that we could, that 
that, uh, that actually I'm sure both of you see in your programs as well. These girls become binti girls, and they go out into the community with a real sense of pride about who they are. They, they almost wear a badge. Um, sometimes they do wear t-shirts, but it, it's like they have a badge that says, don't mess with me, I'm a binti girl. And I'm sure many of those girls have actually said, don't mess with me, I'm a binti girl. And I know that people in that community say, oh, binti girl, I'm not going to mess with her. So there's something about that sense of belonging, um, which we probably all know from our own adolescence as well, that really, uh, that really inspires a lot of confidence and I think is so important. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, at the beginning, it feels like we almost have to break down their confidence. We get a lot of girls at the end of fifth grade who are coming in with, you know, thinking that they're just wonderful students because they've behaved in elementary school and they've been rewarded for behaving and not talking and not participating and not having a voice. And so uh, slowly turning that upside down with them and uh, getting them to understand uh, that it's part of developing confidence and developing leadership to set goals, achieve goals, even if you fall down along the way, to stand up and try again, um, and to develop confidence that spread from competence, as you, as you decided, uh, really builds up a much more resilient and a stronger girl uh, in the end. Um, and this, this can take multiple facets. I think, as you say, community is extremely important because it creates the safe psychological space for girls to be the leader of the environmental club or the leader of the young feminist club or on the honor roll or whatever it could be. There's so many multiple opportunities for her to set a goal and achieve it. Um, we also struggle with parents accepting that students can be confident and can be vocal. Um, I often used to chuckle as a principal. I would see many of the Middle Eastern fathers would be delivering their girls to school in the morning, almost uh, heaving a sigh of relief. Oh, she's safe now, okay, at the age of 11. But by 10th grade, she'd be coming home and terrorizing everyone at the dinner table, right, with her political views and where she's going to call, not terrorizing, but really having found her, her stride. And so that it, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes everybody rowing in the same direction in the school. Uh, and it takes uh, also exposing those girls to people outside their communities uh, and bringing people from outside their communities into the school. That yeah. helps build confidence yeah. because it's important for the girls to see that people care about what they're doing, that they're under a spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many different ways that you can approach this, and I'm sure we're all doing things similarly, but also uniquely in our own settings. I think um, when people ask just now what they could do, to me, and I'm not talking about the school that I am uh, here, I'm talking about this one and other ones, when you, um, take children from one world and put them in another, and, I'm, and, I've, and I've had experience at various places. You need huge amount of support, a, a scaffolding in place. And there is no substitute for mentoring, for a quality mentor. So those of you that um, perhaps, uh, you know, want to mentor children, I mean, there is nothing like a good role model, like somebody who's there to support. And by that I mean to develop a relationship with somebody, even if it's an online relationship, where if, you've had a good, if a child's had a good day or not a good day, you have someone to share it with. And I think that's one of the most important things about building children up, girls especially, in the, trying to get them to be the sort of role models and leaders that we want them to be. They need some scaffolding to start with. They need mentors. They need good role models, which you've mentioned from either outside or within. And we're incredibly lucky at the moment. I, I have never met such a committed team of people. And I think it takes a team of teachers, of staff. I'm not only talking about faculty, I'm talking about the other people in the school, that we're all aligned and focused on the vision to build these, these girls up. And that's what we've got. We've got the most amazing group of men and women, and, and that's important to have men role models for the, for the girls, especially many of them who come out of, of, of dysfunctional homes. And so I think 
the role of individuals, working as individuals and as members of an aligned team is hugely important. So I'm going to talk, that was a nice transition. I'm going to um, give you all a warning. I'm going to ask one final question. Um, and then um, we're going to open it up um, so you can be getting your questions ready right now. And so you talked about having men and women. We've heard throughout the day about gender stereotypes. And you are all working with women who live in very gendered societies. Tell us a story about what's working as you address some of the gender stereotypes that your girls are coming up against. Well, I, I really do believe we're doing a better job with the girls than we are with the boys. I really do. <laughs> I think that we have found a way in the all-girls school environment to uh, really make palpable the world of limitless po un unlimited possibilities for our girls, and we encourage it in so many ways. Uh, and I think all of us probably are doing the translation of the media for them and pointing out you know, the toxic mes me messages that they're seeing on TV, on the internet, on the radio, and on billboards. Uh, what that's about. We're doing a really good job at that, I think, for girls. And so they're going out into the world armed uh, with a belief uh, uh, that they can do anything they want to. What they come up against very often, um, I think, is I I'm not sure how to solve that problem. What happens outside the arms of the school? Uh, I know that we're preparing them. Uh, and I think that over time, I mean, certainly the world has changed from when I was a girl. Uh, and there has been a breakdown of those gender barriers. But we have a long, long way to go. Um, well, in, in South African society is, is still very far behind. I mean, it's a very patriarchal society. Uh, as you know, our president has four wives, which is a quite an interesting role model for the rest of the country, but it's quite interesting that he's not generally, um, that, that aspect of, of, of uh, Zulu culture is not necessarily appreciated by everybody. But we have to be really careful to um, let our girls see different role models and to, not, and to be proud of the cultures they come out of. We can never, ever, where we come from, um, be uh, minimizing the impact or the uh, uh, a Zulu father has got a very special role in the family and even the Zulu men at our school have very special roles and so we, we walk the balance between saying to girls yes you can do anything uh, but be aware that you are going into a real world where you're going to come up against it and one can't be Pollyanna about this and say it doesn't happen because it does and we're living in a, certainly in our society, and I think indeed in much of Africa, the society is still very, very paternalistic. So we have to think of clever, subtle ways of working with that. And you need to teach girls how to be clever and subtle. Very important. Women. Teaching adolescent girls how to be subtle, that sounds <laughs> Mm, in the future, to be subtle women, to get there, to know how to get there, to know how to make d other people think it's their decision when actually it's their decision. You know, it's all that we all know about it. That's what we've been doing. <laughs> but you bring up fascinating points. I mean, we are so fortunate in this country. The problems that we're dealing with, if you compare that to South Africa or South America or places in Asia where <laughs> But we're legislated. We are the most legislated, wonderfully open society. You are not allowed to discriminate on the grounds of race or gender or sexual orientation. I mean, we're far, far, dare I say it, ahead of the United States in some of our, um, those sort of laws. And I mean, we have the most amazing uh, constitution of human rights and children's rights. So legally, it's all there. Okay. It's the practice. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's, that's, and that's what we all hold up, and that's what we are hoping you know, will win the day. But we have the most amazing human rights-based constitution and child rights-based constitution, which is huge. That's the law. What happens in practice is sometimes different. Yeah, that's well, another gap we need to work on. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's absolutely no gap in the United States between what happens. <laughs> <laughs> 
guess, speaking to the idea of practice, I was working with one, supporting one program in Malawi that was run by Save the Children. And most of our programs, the Nike Foundation's programs, are um, totally single sex. But this program was a little bit different. And, and so we really dug in there to try to understand why is it that the, sometimes the girls were in groups alone? Why is it that they wanted to have these health clubs together with boys? What, what was going on there? And what we found out and what our Say the Children colleagues knew so well was that, look, when we're working with girls at a younger age or in places where they might feel really um, nervous about their capacities, like, like say with literacy, um, we need a single sex environment. We need to build girls up to get to a certain skill level. But um, interestingly, in this community, when they wanted to talk about health or sex or any of these things, they wanted to be together in the same room. And what they said was, we wanted to try on our new gender roles and, mm -hmm. and work them out together. So it was really a space for girls and boys to figure out how they were going to be the next generation in their village working together. And I think we have a lot to Important. learn yeah. from that program. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. So are we ready to try and open it up? I see uh, folks are by the microphones. How about all the way back in the blue? No, it's right there. Yep, you just, yep there you are. Um, Girls for a Change, which is a social change after school program here in the United States and then also we have a team in Rwanda. And I have three really brief points that I just want to um, get any comment on. First about the boys. I think that if we can uh, complement religious-based programs on manhood and sports-based programs, then that would go a long way to develop young men and that's actually something we're working on with partners that know men much better than we do. And the other piece is that um, the premise of our program is really having girls who reside in low-income circumstances to recognize their own power through the power of social change. And so they actually lead the program facilitated by coaches. And I just wanna, uh, something that's a little, not, it's missing a little bit for me today is really talking to girls about what their authentic power is and having them decide what they wanna put their energy behind versus, uh, in complement to, I guess, youth philanthropy, uh, which is a very different, we actually talk to girls about the difference between service and change and how those two things work together. So that's another aspect that I just wanted to bring up. And the last, um, really is kind of that evaluation piece. Um, and I really welcome anyone, I would love to have a conversation tomorrow morning at breakfast with anyone that wants to talk about evaluation. Uh, I wanna share what we're doing and I wanna hear what other people are doing around that because I think this soft skill conversation that we're having is the very thing that prepares girls and fills the gap when they don't feel confident in themselves to really get them to open up to all the academic and the the uh, advocacy and the job preparedness and all that. And the last point I'll make is that I don't think college is the path for every child. And I think we forget that. Mm. I so think there is, a, there needs to be room in the conversation about how do we support youth in their path that may or may not include college. So, so some great challenges yeah. tossed back no, to the I, I, I agree, and, and I don't think that any program can pretend to be all things to all people. Um, we want all of our girls to have the option to go to college if they want it, uh, but there are certain, certainly other pathways uh, post-secondary. I think we could all agree that high school is not enough for anyone, boy or girl, at least not in this economy. Uh, and it is changing so rapidly, it's becoming so demanding of us intellectually to learn new skills that are popping up almost daily. Uh, so high school is not enough for anyone, but I would agree with you, there's other ways to uh, develop and, and empower yourself. Uh, in terms of uh, the philanthropy, we don't, in our public schools, we, maybe we should use the word philanthropy more, but we talk about community service and we have tremendous community service programs going on. And yes, in the communities where the schools are and the kids love to engage in them, they love to engage with their little sisters in the elementary school or with uh, CBOs in the neighborhood. It's empowering, it's important, uh, and I would agree with you that uh, that is a wonderful resource we need to leverage. I also, I was gonna <coughs> dig into and make sure that we answer your question on valuation, because I know those of us who are looking to um, raise money know that what funders are saying is, show me the metrics, you know, show me the data. So, Andrew? Um, I would just like to say that um, I agree with you that not everybody's headed towards college and we can't be all things to all people, but the school that we 
we am at the moment, was specifically founded to create leaders who showed academic um, potential. And just as any top um, independent school in the United States, the children would be aspiring to college. One of the things that I'm proudest of is that we are about to have our first graduating class. In South Africa, you write final national exams. The national exams last for five weeks and they will be starting in October and the children will be finishing in uh, the 30th of November. And what I'm proudest of is that I can look at people and say, every single one of the girls that arrived five years ago with very little maths, a lot, uh, very little English, but with the it factor. That was what Oprah Winfrey looked for in the first two groups, was the it factor. Take it as you like. But they all have the it factor. But they all have buckled down, and every single one of those girls is going on to university. I mean, that is remarkable. So I'm not, being I'm not being apologetic because I think we've got hundreds of programs, certainly we do, and we are always looking at the remedial, you know, how to support the children. My question is, do we do enough for the bright sparks at the top? And there are many programs in South Africa where we're not doing enough for getting the, we are trying, we are trying to, if you like it, as somebody said, you're trying to turn cream into super cream. Yes. And, but somebody's got to look after the cream. So I'm very happy to look after the cream. And I'm not apologetic about it, and I think the cream also deserves a chance. <laughs> well, I, think we, I think we also all believe that there's lots of cream mixed up in yes. all oh, that's the right. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to your point about girls being agents of change and, and choosing their own path uh, rather than having us sort of direct where that path will go, um, and not speaking to the college question as much, but just as far as what empowerment looks like. And I think that the, the beauty of the safe space model, which you could also call a girls club or a girl group or whatever you want to call it, is that those relationships are developed, confidence is developed, and girls can go with it where they want to go. If they want to go to the local leaders and demand electricity, they're going to do that, and that's the most empowering thing they, they could do. If they wanted to buckle down and study for their exams, they could go in that direction too. So um, I, I, really, I really believe in, in providing that platform for girls to direct their own change. I appreciate the question. And I think it's both. I actually think it's, I, think, I think it's making sure the environment is such that they, they know there's an expectation they will rise to the challenge, and then enriching that environment with all sorts of challenges that they can intersect with in a way that feels appropriate for their level of ability at the moment or their level of passion. I think entrepreneurial leaders are what we really need in looking at the post-2008 economies of the world. I mean, we have to create entrepreneurs. Yeah children who will take risks, do things, make, it, make a difference in their communities, whatever that difference is. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Monisha Bajaj. I'm a professor of um, international education and development studies at Teachers College, Columbia University. And a lot of my research is on gender and education in the Global South. And I include New York, parts of New York City in the Global South as well. I really appreciated all your presentations. It's really inspiring to hear about the work that you're doing. My question is related to um, the fact that it's the human right of every child to have the quality education that you're providing in these kind of alternative and innovative spaces. And Kathleen, I believe, talked about her initiative being a pr public-private partnership. But I'm wondering what impact, um, you clearly have, all of you have a lot of experience and knowledge turning the cream into the super cream or what you've experimented with in these small spaces. And I'm wondering how that has and can influence public policy, not so much legislation, which sounds so pretty, but actual policies that the government can take on for the vast majority of girls and boys in disadvantaged situations to be able to take advantage of what you've learned in these philanthropic and, and kind of ideal, ideal and very successful spaces that you've created. Yeah, that's a big that's question, a big <laughs> and it's, but it's one I've thought about for over 30 years now. and. Um, <clears throat> In a way, it saddens me to see the policy wonks running around with this strategy and that. St we know what makes a great school. You have to have a great leader, 
You have to have great teachers. You don't even really need a building, although it's nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? Uh, and you okay. have to have everyone focused on the same goal. Now, somewhere along the line, <clears throat> and I don't want to blame teachers. Teachers are my heroes. In fact, we just honored them this week. Um, somehow along the line, the government and the unions started running schools instead of the educators. So turning that chip of state around <laughs> Uh, is a very, very difficult task, but I think that um, having the, the freedom to choose the right leader and the right teachers would enhance any school, any public school. Uh, then the funding issue, obviously public schools never get enough money, and here in New York City our budgets have been eroding over the last three years, and so what our foundation is able to raise in terms of supplementing the public school budget is absolutely essential. But, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, your programs are very expensive. Compare our programs to the local private school down the street, it's minuscule. The, the gap in resources is so enormous. And yet, I believe that we can match in terms of quality education what's going on in the private schools if we have the freedom to do what we know works. Um, I think it's a societal thing. Um, I think the, the most important aspect of this, if you look at it, is teachers. And I think I'm correct in that I would say that in the United States, as in South Africa, and in many other countries, teacher, teaching is not the number one choice of your top students. <clears throat> um, it's medical school, or law school, or business. Well, perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm wrong, but certainly, in, and whereas in countries such as Finland, um, and a few other countries like that, where teaching is really, you are proud what is your child, what is your daughter going to do, what is your son going to do? And if you say, well, you know, my son wants to go into the teaching profession, well, people will say, well, that's good. But if you say, my son is, or his daughter has been accepted into medical school or business school, it's, it's quite interesting that, that we, it's a society thing that, that we actually need to look about, because if teachers are valued, then a whole lot of other stuff is going to change because at the heart of everything, whether it's government, private, anything else, the heart of everything are the teachers, are the human resources that we need to put into this project of education for every girl everywhere. Well, and it's the natural extension. I think if we know that girls are relational beings. I, I believe boys are as well. And, and what we know is mentoring is so very important that really extends to the relationship they have with the teacher in the classroom. And so I absolutely agree with Kathleen that mm -hmm. I think it's the ability to have really talented, committed teachers who mm -hmm. are passionate about what they do and who love children. And the more we can put those folks in our classrooms, the better our schools are going to be. And it's a very, that's a, an excellent question. Um, and I, I think it's a, it, it is the right question, and I think it's the hard question. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm Travis, I represent Starfish One by One. We work with adolescent girls in Guatemala. I, think I need to actually give you um, a prize. I think you are the first male who stood up and asked a question. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> well, I have to I say that because in, in our in, in our in all our audiences, typically, as you watch, those of you who are women know, typically it's the men who jump up and ask the questions, and the women wait. The women wait. So it's just lovely to be in a room where you have waited. A nice waited my turn. <laughs> My question pertains to culture and, and primarily the organizational culture. You all represent very successful models of programs in schools in contexts that frequently pull the opposite direction. And my question is, in a school like South Africa, where obviously you are bucking the trend tremendously with the results that you're presenting, uh, how do you sustain a more And teach children who are committed and who need lots of care. Along the way, I think so much is happening in education at the moment with, with all the, the developments in technology, with the focus um, on reflection, on compassion, 
on some of the soft skills that people never talked about 25 years ago. The whole focus in education has shifted, and I think a 21st century education demands such different things that, that one of the things I try and do is I try and help uh, find conferences, courses, people to come and visit, talk, and so that people can grow. Um, I see my job as growing teachers. Yeah. The teachers grow the children, I grow the teachers. And I think that's what a head of a school needs to do, is to grow the human resources. Because, as we said just now, you, if you, with human resources, anything is possible. A building is good, but a tree is also fine. It's the human resources we've got to focus on, and we've got to make people realize that actually that's where the money must go, into the human resources. Buildings are great, facilities are terrific, but they're not essential. So human resources. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you um, want to say something? I, I did. I mean, I mean um, building off your point, we're not working in schools specifically. Normally, the, the young women or even girls who run our programs are um, girls who come from those communities, young women who come from those communities who had some sort of leg up, leg up in some way or another. Maybe they went through the program themselves. So they have an incredible passion and drive to give back, as you were saying. Th these are their communities. These are their girls. They want to bring them up. And what we need to do and what we need to do a better job of of, um, frankly, is keeping those young women on a career path where they keep getting invested in, um, really focusing on their capital development as well. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we're trying to instill leadership in the children, but we also try to instill leadership in our teachers and uh, create leadership positions for them within their classroom, within the school, within the network of schools. Um, so that's really important work. Um, have you ever heard of the book, If You Don't Feed the Teachers, They'll Eat the Children? <laughs> it's a very wise title. You have to develop your human resources, as you just said. <laughs> that's the true name of a book. <laughs> and, and I think I just would add a um, slightly different twist on what you all have said. I would say um, you pay attention to the culture because you can actually shape a culture and I think it takes a lot of intentionality to decide what you want the culture to reflect and then build it into the culture. It's an easy thing for me to say our culture has been around for 200 years at our school but I do think <laughs> as, you, as you start at the very beginning of the program or the very beginning of the school mm -hmm. if you pay attention to the qualities that you are trying to instill in the culture the culture helps you ultimately take care of that sustainability issue that you're talking about. Yes ma'am. Um. I think we have right, coming right behind you. Thank you, Andrea. Hi, I'm from the Mariposa Foundation in the Dominican Republic. And my question has to do with holistic education. Um, we've already discussed today our parents. Some people have spoken about our parents being the most, our first educators, our most important educators. What do you all do to work with families, with mothers and fathers? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> in, in a world of limited resources, uh, I, I often regret that if we had unlimited resources, there would be a parent academy in every single one of our schools. Mm -hmm. uh, our parents want it, they need it, they have so much development within themselves that we really can't actualize because we're busy focusing on their children. Um, and there's a number of, of, of ways. I guess the, the most important way we do it in our public schools is through advisory, which breaks down a big school into small components. So every advisory teacher is the bridge to the home. And so calling with the good news and calling with events and inviting parents in, building trust, it's very important, especially parents that are not used to a positive educational experience in the countries that they come from. But it's that constant communication back and forth and building that level of trust that really maximizes what you can do with children. When they're ready to go off to college, a lot of the families want them to stay right here at a local community college. You'll say, but she's got a full scholarship to Brown. No, but I want her to stay near home. So if you've been working with that parent over a multi-year continuum and they trust you, even though they've never been to college themselves, you can leverage that relationship to get something better for the child. It's very important. 
one of the uh, real tenets of community development, and, and that's what that's what our programs do, is working with the families along the way. I mean, the first thing you do is identify a girl's gatekeepers, um, the people who can say yes or no to her, and usually those are her parents, uh, in many cases her father, and, and we really have deliberate plans, our partners have deliberate plans to engage them along the way, usually through village meetings or community meetings or parent meetings. And one thing we found that's been very effective is if you really have conversations early on about goals for their children, um, then all of those check-ins can be about reaching that goal. And, and sometimes it takes a long conversation to get to um, a goal that everyone can agree on together. <laughs> but um, but, but it's, it's a long and engaged process. I think it has to be. Yeah. Uh, we have a very different uh, setup in that uh, many of our, as I said, our children come from far away. Only about 25% of our children have parents. Um, the others would have um, a mother, a single mother, or many of them have caregivers who are aunts or grandparents, um, because there are, many of them are AIDS orphans. So we don't, uh, the parents send the children to us and then we try and communicate with them, and the only way we can communicate with them is via the children, so three times a year, or we can send them SMS messages on their cell phones. There is no other way of communicating, if you can believe it. There's no postal deliveries. There are no, many of them don't have internet. So we rely on, and then we have, but what we do have, we have four full-time social workers who, spend, who go out to every single one. We have 380 girls who go to every single, visit every home every year. We have a, uh, one of our social workers is specifically trained to deal with HIV and AIDS, and she goes into families where there are people suffering from HIV and AIDS. Um, we have, on an average, a death of a caregiver every single week. We are dealing with that. And our social workers are the, unlike you, you folks, our social workers are the link between ourselves and our families. It's a wow. very, very different situation. We have parent meet we had a parent meeting this year in Soweto where we had fifty parents come. They were the local parents who could come and we'll have one next month down in KwaZulu Natal. But there are people who come from places where there there's no, it, it's six it's two hundred kilometers to the nearest town. So it's we and I suppose that's one of the difficulties is dealing with rural and urban in the same at the same at the same institution. But what we try and say to every girl is your family is important, your culture is important, and someone is going to be there for you. So if, for example, last week we had a, a message that one of the aunts was, was, was uh, at death's door, we, she flew down with the social worker to Durban, and they then traveled two hours in the car to go and visit this family. So, I mean, that's, and I mean, we're very lucky. We have the resources to do that, but it's a, it's a, it's a strange model. But I mean, what we're trying to do is to give a few girls a huge chance. People say to me, all that money spent on those girls. It's a very interesting philosophy. Oprah Winfrey said, why shouldn't some girls have the best chance possible that are available to so many other girls. It's a very, very interesting look at providing quality education to a few, if you like, 72 girls in a graduating group, which is still pretty remarkable. But they are getting, she said, they are getting, I want them to have the very best there is. Some people find that difficult to accept, but I can understand it. Thank you. Um, and you are wise, wise, wise um, to be thinking about the ways in which you engage parents because uh, personally, um, I believe that a young woman needs as many adult mentors mm -hmm. to surround her through the journey of adolescence as she can find. And partnering with parents in that process is certainly key to that. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question, right? There's two. Oh, we have two? Okay, so we have one, two. There we go. Let's go over there. <laughs> Thank you for taking my question. Sumru Arkut from the Wellesley Centers for Women. Um, I wanted to commend all three different ways that we heard about of connecting the generations because you 
do it in different ways, but it, an issue that hasn't been brought up today is that when we provide quality education for every girl everywhere, we inevitably create a gap between the generations. Because if the previous generation had had what we hope the present generation will have, there wouldn't be such a big gap. One of the ways in which this is an important issue is that parents or people who act in lieu of parents have to deal with a sense of loss, that while they may willingly give up their daughter to an institution that's going to give them a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. there is the loss, and that mother who wants her daughter to go to local community college is being real about what it means for her to lose her daughter to Brown. On the flip side, there is the daughter's alienation, possible alienation from her roots, and I really enjoyed the way all of you addressed the issue of valuing where she's coming from to keep her rooted. It's good to keep, it's, it's good to give young women wings, but building on the roots is even more valuable. So this is a dilemma that all of us who care so much about quality education for every girl everywhere have to keep in mind that it is very important to recognize that when we educate young women, we give them a new language, a new voice, but not cut them off from where they're coming from. We hope to let them become bicultural, if you will, acculturate them into other options that are out there for them, um, but make the connection real. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one last question over here. Hi there, I'm Dana Dakin and with Women's Trust. It's uh, based in Pokwasi, Ghana. One village, very scalable. Um, <laughs> no, it, it is. And uh, the question, we have pieces of these, this enrichment going on. We've, we've, we've de adapted, developed from on the ground input and working with local girls. How could we have access to, is there a training program where a, a foundation comes and works with a committed group and, and makes our program more integrated uh, and, and brings in best practices, but takes it right to the community leaders who are all on board, the parents and the teachers. Is there a program where there's leverage why, you know, why are we doing this just here? Where, how can we leverage this from community to community? Because this is the most obvious idea for sustainability is, is to enrich the girl's life and, and get them on a path of, of making good entrepreneurial, I agree with you, entrepreneurial leadership kinds of decisions in their daily lives. Could, could I take this opportunity to uh, invite all of you <laughs> Uh, to uh, a forum that Young Women's Leadership Network is hosting with the National Coalition of Girls Schools. I left some flyers back there. It's the National Conference on Girls Education uh, next February in Washington, D.C. It's on the NCGS website. Uh, because we've been getting uh, people asking us, how do you do what you do? And we're asking the private Schools, how do you do what you do? And we need a forum for our teachers and practitioners, like Sarah at the Nike Foundation, to come together under one tent and share those best practices. So that's not a complete answer, but that's one pathway, that's one forum where I think you could learn a lot from other practitioners. And not just schools, 
We also have people that run programs for girls that will be represented there. So that's one little step. Yeah. Well, and I'm hoping that you will continue to ask that question of others in the room as we have our breaks and things, because I do think that was one of the reasons why we um, at Emma Willard decided to launch this gathering, because we believe that there needed to be a meeting of the minds um, from folks who had the skills and had the practices and those who had um, feet on the ground, if you will, and, and also had dollars and cents to put with those programs to replicate them. You know, how do we create momentum for the girls' education movement? What does that look like? So thank you very much for asking the question.